<laughs> Welcome to Millennial Made, where I, I am today years old, where I learned that you can get lice as a grown adult. Oh, man. <laughs> um, so thanks to everyone submitting feedback on last week's episode. Um, really gassed Andrew up in the comments. Um, he was hyped, and you made his uh, made his whole year. And now he told me that he is um, quitting content creation because he has no need to continue doing any of that. So thank you so much for that so we can pave the way for others. Um, but in all seriousness, and now I'm fearful that I have lice. I can't believe you think I have lice. All in all, I think that having lice as an adult would be a very unique real experience. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, if you listen to last week's episode, you might have heard me mispronounce ethereal, and I said erythral, um, which could have roots in the word urethra. Can I say that word? As a man? <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, mom, I'm sorry if you're listening to this. And my, did you know my grandpa listens to this podcast too, which is so sweet, my sweet grandpa. Um, but again, yes, millennial may, we talk all things, nostalgia, mental health, um, and escape from your work day. My name is Rod. I'm your work bestie. The internet's work bestie. Um, internet's coworker, I think is a better way of saying it. I don't like the word bestie. I've decided, I think it's, uh, it can be demeaning at times. So I'm, I'm starting to move away from that word. Um, every week I have a different, different hyper fixation. Um, this week, my hyper fixation of two things. Um, one is Gatorade zero. I'm just like all on it. Um, really a rainbow of flavors I've tried this week. Blue will always be top, top tier. Then it goes lemon lime. And then I've always just called it white, but apparently it's cherry fruit punch and then orange. Orange is going to be dead last. And there's two different shades of blue. They both tie for number one. Um, my other hyperfixation are jokes about Taylor Swift, which if you didn't know, Taylor Swift was put under fire for um, her harm, I guess you could say, to the environment by being the top of the list for the most CO2 emissions from um, her private jet. And it first came into light because people were bashing the Kardashians for it because people always bash, bashing the Kardashians for doing something outrageous that rich people do. And then people realized that Kylie was number seven on the list. And Taylor Swift's shortest flight, I think, let me see um, what it is. And the jokes on TikTok and Twitter are hilarious. Um, Taylor Swift's shortest flight that caused, yes, thank you, that caused CO2 emission. Um, it was 36 minutes, 36 minutes. And her, I guess, defense and her team's defense was that she rents out her jet when she's not using it, which doesn't help the, the CO2 problem that we have in, uh, in regards to our environment and, and the harm on our oxygen that we breathe in every day. And instead suggested to just start taking um, commercial flights, which I don't think they would ever do. And they, to me, I'm going to be honest with you. To me, there is no draw even about a private jet. Would If I had the opportunity, if someone said, hey, would you like to take a private jet? I think I would pass, honestly. There's nothing to me that, what would you Do you think I would? Utah. You think I would take a private jet? Yeah, probably from Las Vegas to San Francisco. But I didn't. I had opportunity to that I didn't. Anyways, there's nothing appealing to me about it. It just seems like, it, I don't know. It's just like you're going to point A to point B somehow. So why would you you know, want to do the private jet situation? But all that to say, that's my other hyperfixation are Taylor Swift jokes. And I, I've, always, I've said it once, I'll say it again, is I'm not a Swifty. I like Taylor Swift's music. I can appreciate appreciate her as an artist. I can appreciate her as a songwriter. I'm not a Swifty. I don't know her cat's names. Um, I don't know the Easter eggs in her songs. And sometimes y'all be doing a little too much. I'm not going to lie. And I love y'all. I love my Swifties. I understand a large part part of the millennial population are Swifties. Um, But it's just, you know, 
sometimes the homegirls in her life and people are like, oh my God, she walked down this specific street. So that must mean her song is releasing. She walked on 42nd street. So that must mean if you, if you divide four by two, that's two. And then you put four, two, two, that's four twenty two. So her next album she released on April 22nd is the mindset that, um, that I've seen a lot of people have the discourse on TikTok and on Instagram. Um, so all that to say is, um, walk outside, take a mental health walk, uh, breathe some fresh air. Not, not well, Taylor Swift's around though. I'll tell you that. Not with these private jets flying in the air. Um, I really quick was just thinking this week as I walked into my hometown mall and became immediately depressed because it, it, I, if you want to just be humbled quickly on how things age, one of all being yourself, first of all, being yourself, first of all, I was watching Gilmore Girls this week and I, in the first episode, realized Lorelai is 32 years old. And yes, she had Rory at a very young age, but still, she's 32 years old. I'm 32 years old. Lorelai Gilmore owns a house. She runs an inn, um, owns a Jeep, and I don't even know what escrow means. So I think that was a humbling experience. But all I'd say, let me tell you this. Go into your hometown mall and just see how things have changed. Right? A lot of memories are made there. What did we do as kids when uh, we were 16? Couldn't go out. Couldn't, you know, hit up the, the go, go to bars or, you know, even see certain movies. We would go to the mall. And... Um, the fact that I couldn't go to the food court and get an IC was devastating to me. I just remember, let's paint a picture. The year is 2003. You walk into your mall, and there, there were four different types of millennials in the world. There are the Aeropostale millennials. There are the American Eagle millennials. There are the Hollister millennials. And there are the Abercrombie and Fitch millennials, which is now just Abercrombie. Um, and I was an American Eagle, American Eagle millennial, because they had the plus size and they went to double X and God bless them for that. Hollister, Abercrombie, Fitch could never, Aeropostale just never got into the, the large graphics of that. But it said something about you, what type of millennial you were. The Aeropostale were your mom shops for you, which is fine. A lot of people's moms did shop for them, but your mom picked out your clothes for you. That was the Aeropostale. The American Eagle were the, the you didn't want to try so hard. You wanted the little logo on your shirt. You wanted that little eagle because the logos were a big deal. Um, but you didn't, you didn't need to have the glitz and the glam that Hollister and Abercrombie and Fitch would have. Now, Hollister and Abercrombie and Fitch, in my opinion, in my personal opinion, go hand in hand. Um, they're two different types of people at the same level. Hollister are the people who are trying too hard. They're very try hard because they wanted that, especially growing up in the Midwest in Chicago. It's like, why you... You you don't live in Venice, you don't live in Venice Beach. You live in uh, Naperville, and the fact that you're walking around with a puka shell necklace and throwing up this was a uh, it was hang loose is uh that was just too much. And then Abercrombie and Fitch was um, you didn't have to try at all because you just had money and you had looks because you were not publicly shamed the second you stepped into an Abercrombie and Fitch. So those are the four different types of millennials. Yes, you could argue, well, I was a hot topic millennial. You were a different subset, and we know that. Um, the, I feel like Gap millennials weren't a, a thing because Gap was just like where you got essentials. There was no logo associated. Yeah, the Gap logo, I guess, across the shirt, but you didn't have the little corner logo on every piece of clothing, um, which we need to get into V-necks later because that was a whole other situation. Or the Gap Red campaign, that was big. How much did Gap Red raise? I think, because I, I remember I just bought it. I didn't even buy it to be part of the movement. I didn't even know what it did, I think, at the time. But I think it was um, in, oh, $10 million to fight AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. $10 million. That's not a lot, I don't think, for a whole company to donate for an entire clothing campaign. It's still a good amount of money. You, you pick your store. You go shopping. You walk past Victoria's Secret. And you immediately just smell all the smells um, and pretend to close your eyes like this because, you know, you just didn't want to offend anyone. And then you will go to the food court. You pass Sam Goody. You pass Claire's. You pass Delia's. Wet Seal. Some of you might be going to Wet Seal. Like um, myself growing up as a, um, a man did not. Um, but you go to the food court and what you, what, oh, there were different, different options when you walked to that food court. There was the Sbarro 
or some sort of New York style pizza joint, which I could taste it right now. Um, there was some sort of Chinese restaurant. And I remember when I grew up, Panda Express wasn't really a thing. Um, but now a lot of food courts have Panda Express and it wasn't even like a cool, like a, a chain. It was like just that mall had that specific Chinese restaurant and it came in a white takeout container. And then there were, um, there was the smoothie shop and then there was the, like, I think there were random like steak sandwiches. What were you saying? Oh, glory aging coffee. And then th there was, and this wasn't in the food court, but if you were just, if you didn't want to dedicate a whole meal and then sit down, you wanted a quick snack. There were two different types of millennials there. They're the Auntie Anne's or the Mrs. Fields. I guess Nestle too, it could fall into that. I was, my mom had a Mrs. Fields, which is no longer there. Um, and then finally you rounded it all off by going into Spencer's gifts with some friends and just being stupid teenagers um but i don't know why I, that was just peak nostalgia to me just thinking about malls like and malls were such a defining part of our generation and i think there are a lot of things that separate millennials from different generations and i think every generation is different in their own right but i think for us it was the access to technology and the fact that like we could go to the mall get dropped off by our parents but then we would have direct access to tell them when and where to pick us up rather than, Hey, we have to meet at the door at four o'clock. You'd be like, Hey, ready to get picked up. Cause you could just T nine right away. Um, social media, you know, we would go to the mall or go, go out to have a photo opportunity to put on MySpace or Facebook at the time. And then there was also the access to music and there's so much, we, everything started to come quickly to our, like, come really quickly to us a lot faster than in previous generations because we had the internet and we grew up with the internet, which I think was really interesting because there was this article that the Atlantic put out and the um, author was Kate Lindsay. And the, the title is, are you sure you're not guilty of the millennial pause? And I was like, Oh, I was ready for something like really insightful or like, you know, this like deep intuitive thing, um, which it, it could be. And she makes it a bigger thing, but basically, um, the article says the first generation to grow up with social media, millennials are now becoming the first generation to age out of it, which at first got me a little upset. Cause I'm like, Oh, like I, what if we don't want to age out of it? You know, it's like, why do we have to be put into a box that we are aging out of it? Um, and I'll go into it a little bit. Um, and I'm going to read a couple excerpts, excerpts that Kate Lindsay wrote here. It says, once my eyes were open to the millennial pause, I started noticing my age in every part of my internet experience. I get confused whenever Instagram changes its layout. I use gifts to make jokes in Slack. I've posted song lyrics on my Instagram story. The range of mannerisms is so broad. The signs such a staple of of my online behavior for the past 15 years that it's not even worth trying to fight them. And I think that's just such an interesting perspective because we are so closely in relation. And we talk about this generational war, right? Between Gen Z and millennials, but it's, we have so much Gen Z content at our grasp because of social media, especially specifically TikTok and Instagram, where it gets fed to us. We don't even ask for it. The algorithm can feed us content from those specific age groups. Um, you know, looking at the Charlie D'Amelio's of the world, Addison Rae's and Noah Beck's. And with our parents or with the generation before us, um, Gen X or boomers, they didn't necessarily have that access. It was pretty hard cut off or, you know, they just were able to live their life and keep living it without having to compare to a generation that came after us where, you know, even for me, I compare my aesthetic and what I do on social media to that of a Gen Z creator. You know, like one of my friends, Brittany Broski has a very specific comedy style. And she has a very specific following and they love her comedy stuff, but I compare myself to her all the time, but I don't need to because she's completely different. So Kate also says in this article, and given their need to insert themselves into every new internet trend, millennials are also sometimes active participants in their own critique. Since they can't beat the Gen Z creators parroting them, some millennials have joined them recreating the fashion, hair and makeup of their youth in similarly popular videos which I thought that was really interesting because we, you know, I think even what kind of what I do on the internet too, is just, if you don't follow me on socials is, um, kind of make fun of that. Like what trends are coming back, you know, the millennial recaps or just stitching videos that I see. I saw someone 
like call 2000, a coach back from 2003 vintage. Um, but even sometimes I'll find like, I am now wearing a lot of straight leg jeans and a lot of straight leg pants because that's what nineties trends are coming back. Um, or, you know, like big oversized jackets and oversized tees. Um, because I, I, I always have the need to fit in, which I guess this could be something I'm packing in therapy later. Probably will, to be honest. Is just wanting well, to fit in. None of this, Kate Lindsay also says, none of this is necessarily a bad thing. Even if it bruises my ego, a 35 year old desperately adopting the mannerisms of a 20 year old is a different kind of cringe. Instead, in spite of the occasional embarrassment, the millennial ticks that remain have gone from trend to nostalgia. And besides, when Gen Alpha comes from Gen Z's internet, you better believe I'll have been taking, I'll be taking notes, which I think is exactly what our parents are probably doing is they're laughing at us getting mad about these trends that we see Gen Z hopping on um, because we did the same thing with our parents. Um, I remember there's certain trends that we wore that my mom's like, oh my God, I can't believe that's coming back. I asked my dad to borrow one of his t-shirts once as, you know, that, that moment happened and it was just eye-opening that it's not happening to us. But I, I kind of wanted to talk about this, though, is kind of embracing the cringe. And yeah, like even this is a word I help perpetuate the word chuggy and things like that. I think it's okay to be cringe. And it's also, why did we have to call it cringe? Or why does it have to be a negative thing? Like, why can't you just be yourself? And whatever yourself is, it is what it is. And if you are effortlessly able to fit it, to fit in with the Gen Z aesthetic or the Gen Z culture, go for it. Because you, you know, you probably have been able to do that your whole life. You know, you're just cool, collected. Me, I could have never done that. I think I try too hard to do some things like that sometime, and then I get in my own head, and then it just causes me to spiral. And it's when I truly just start making things for myself or things that I think are fun is when I'm able to um, embrace it and make the best type of content that I want to make or live my best life. Or, you know, just if you want to put a GIF in Slack, do we decide if it's GIF or GIF? I think it's GIF. If you want to put a GIF in Slack, put a GIF in Slack. If you want to use emojis, use emojis. Who cares what certain things mean? Um, and yes, we can joke around and Gen Z can make fun of us and we can make fun of Gen Z and that's always going to happen. But at the end of the day, I feel like embracing the cringe could have a really negative connotation and overall just make us overthink a lot of things that we're doing in life where just live your life and however you want to live it is uh, the way you should be living it. And just doing something because it's a certain vibe or it's a certain aesthetic or not doing something because it doesn't fit the vibe or doesn't fit the aesthetic, but you want to do it is in a way that you should continue living. But I wanted to get to some advice because you guys had some um, pretty good pieces of advice that I, uh, I put on uh, you guys asked on Instagram. So I wanted to go over that. Um, and specifically with work, whenever I, I post like, Hey, let me give you some advice just cause I'm, I'm no expert. I'm no mental health expert. I'm no corporate America expert. I've just, I've been in the seat of someone who has had mental health, a big mental health journey and still going through a big one, especially the past couple months. Um, or with work specifically, I've worked a couple different jobs and I think I've just realized what I want in a workplace and have been able to be vocal about it. Um, but the, biggest question I always get is, should I quit my job? And even just that alone, should I quit my job is the question. And it's a very broad question. And I think it depends on the person and what they're able to afford in that time. Um, but this one was very specific and I wanted to talk about it. It says, should I leave the company for definite small step up or stay for potential big promotion? Um, and I think this is a very complex question in my personal, and I worked in sales. So sales is a very fast moving environment and, you know, people get promoted overnight or people wait years to get promoted. Um, but now with the marketing part, I can see how it's a little bit more structured and, you know, it's like there's steps in place to get a promotion, which again, I said this, I think last week or I've said it multiple times is not everyone also has to strive for a promotion if you don't want to. Um, but with the small leaving for a small step up or stay for a big promotion, I feel like if there's not a timeline on the big promotion, I would take the small step up because the small step up could be a small step up. But then at the small step up, you could 
wait for a big promotion the same amount of time you would wait for a big promotion there. And I don't think uh, we view it as a negative thing, change in the workplace, but I don't think it's a negative thing. I think it's, um, like changing, changing a career or change, like I said, changing a company or environment change is growth. And I feel like we oftentimes have a lot of guilt for leaving a company that pours so much into us. But at the end of the day, we're just, I don't want to say disposable, but a company could easily fill your shoes. Um, and yes, like you were probably offering a lot to them and you're offering some like a specific individual characteristic that they won't be able to find anyone else. But at the end of the day, they will find someone to fill your position. So why not explore something new if, if you think that it's going to be better even in a short term spot? Because like I said earlier, I talked, I, I, we are living in a world now where we can see pictures from 15 billion light years away. We are, I was even looking at a, picture, a map of the solar system today and I saw how close we are to the asteroid belt. I'm like one asteroid could hit us in a second and I'm not fear mongering or any of that, but um, why not do something that, you know, would make you happy even f- in the short term. It doesn't have to be a long-term plan. So my advice to you there would be, I would take the, uh, the definite small step up instead of possibly waiting for a big step in the future. Um, Another piece of advice that someone asked um, was what um, what do I think of unpaid internships? And I think this is really interesting because the companies that I've worked for that I've had unpaid interns, it was in an environment where the people, the interns were lucky enough to have been born into a family with money um, or, been, you know, they go to a school that will still support them. Um so I think uh, my opinion might be a little bit jaded there, but I feel like uh, just in general, unpaid interns seem a little icky to me because they're, you know, interns, it's kind of a joke that interns are given, you know, uh, scrap work. They're given, you know, I think it's called scut is now it's called, um, where they're, you know, doing chores basically, or just running, getting coffee or doing things that, you know, don't fulfill the job description. And they're there just to observe. Right. But they're not really observing. They're doing that maybe an hour or two a week. They're more like an assistant. So why not pay them assistant salary and then maybe just hire less interns, but who am I to say? But I think that if you're, um, head of a company manager, CEO out there listening to this podcast for some reason, I would suggest finding a way to have paid interns because then also they'll probably want to work a little bit harder for you too. And then that'll show your investment in them. And then some of the best employees that I've worked with were former interns at the company because they knew about the company ahead of time and they were able to be, they were passionate about it and they loved it because they were treated well. So why not treat your employees well, have them come back, have them grow at a company that they believe in and then you know, what a cool story to say that they started as an intern and then they've grown through the company if they want to grow. Um, and then the last question I got, which is a pretty, again, vague question, but I did want to talk about it because it's something that happens to me a lot recently specifically is dealing with depression. I know it's dark, but it's happening uh, now to many people. And depression is a very dark thing and it is, you know, life altering at times. And it has, for me, my depression just hits out of nowhere. I'll be having the best day ever. And then all of a sudden I just get hit, boom, with a wave of depression right on the head. And when I become depressed, I isolate and I shut people out and I stop responding to texts. And it's really an episode for me. Um, and usually what I'll do is I'll just kind of embrace it. I'm not saying sit in it. I'm not sitting in my depression, but I'm recognizing it and realizing what it is. And I think once you do that, you're able to look it in the eye and see what it is. And that's usually overthinking, anxiety, anxious thoughts. And then what you can do from there is figure out, okay, well, what do I need to do to come out of this? Is it something as small as, you know, listening to an upbeat song or something for some serotonin, or is it going to be something a little bit more, you know, like, emergency therapy appointment. Um, there's hotlines out there. You could call a lot of resources. I always talk about Jed foundation. So check out the Jed foundation. If you haven't done that yet, um, for mental health resources, but yeah, depression, we use it as a joke. Sometimes I think it's just 
it's a kind of the, and I think that dark comedy, especially on TikTok, has grown over the past couple of years in relation to, to depression because we're all going through it. Um, but how I deal with it would be, like I said, kind of looking at it at it in the eye and figuring out what it is, how big or small it is, and then from there, um, just knowing myself. And that's the season of life I'm in right now is figuring out myself. And I feel like I was talking to one of my best friends today about it was there's a difference between selfishness and putting yourself first. So selfishness would be, you know, just doing things to, for, to put yourself before other people, but putting yourself first, I guess would be that too, but putting yourself first is realizing that you need to, re, you need to come to terms with specific things in your life in order to make your life better and clearer. Cause I think that for me, depression is fog and in order to get through the fog, you need to have clarity and you need a light. And I think you'll find that clarity and that light when you have a better understanding of yourself. So just do what you can to put yourself first in those situations. And I think over communicate too can never be a bad thing. And I think again, depression has become, um, a punchline, but, with your friends, it's like, Hey, like, you don't even say I'm depressed, but like, Hey, I'm just kind of in a funk today. Or I, um, I'm not in a good mental space to go out tonight and I don't want to affect anyone else. And just be the more honest you are with the people around you, they'll either be able to help or they'll give you the space to help yourself. Um, so I think that's, those are the things that I've done, um, is look at it in the eye, putting myself first and then over communicating, um, with the friends and those around me. But I hope this was a good millennial made episode. My leg is very much asleep from sitting cross leg for 25 minutes. Um, but I just, again, want to appreciate everyone listening to this. Uh, we are leaning towards the rod squad as a name for the listeners. So, um, if you have ideas for merch or for, um, again, future topics, I'm always taking suggestions flying to LA this week to film some interviews with people. So excited to see who, you, um, it's some really, ex- really exciting people that you guys are going to um, be pumped to see. Um, one in particular, I know that the emos that listen are going to love. Um, but just want to say thank you to all the rod squad people out there. Um, have a safe week, take care of yourself, put yourself first and like subscribe and have a good rest of your day.